Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Burke County Board of Commissioners pre-agenda meeting for Thursday, November 16, 2018. Welcome, and uh, all of our commissioners are present today, along with county manager, attorney, financial uh, officer, and the clerk. I'll ask you to silence your mobile devices if you have uh, some of those this afternoon. And when you present, please come to the table up front and be sure the microphone is turned on so that uh, everybody can hear you. Gentlemen, you've received the uh, agenda uh, earlier. I'll entertain a motion at this time to uh, approve the agenda. Well, Mr. Thank you, Wayne. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. All right, we'll have several presentations this afternoon. First, we're coming from Burke County Public Schools. This will be a presentation of financial data for the period ending September 30, 2018. And uh, Keith, we'll hear you at this time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be here today to uh, uh, cover the uh, Burke County Public Schools uh, first quarter financial results. Uh, the first sheet in your uh, packet, and uh, it'll be the only sheet I'll cover. Uh, the other, uh, the other uh, sheets uh, following that, I'll certainly entertain any questions if you have any, but uh, the first sheet, we have a column entitled Previous. That is last year's uh, entire Burke County Public School budget consisting of all funding sources. Uh, which was $106.6 million. Uh, we estimate for the 18-19 school year revenues of $108.2 million. Uh, that's a slight increase uh, uh, in, in budget, but if you will look below, 85% uh, of our total annual budget consists of payroll and related benefits. Uh, Wage increases, uh, state legislated wage increases for this year were anywhere from zero to 14.8% and 2% for classified staff. Uh, if you take that into account uh, with the increased uh, cost for health insurance of 7.3% and retirement of 10.1, we would anticipate uh, an increase of about 4% in our budget or $4.3 million. Obviously, we haven't seen uh, that much of a dollar increase in our annual budget this year. Uh, but of course, uh, we do uh, count on one thing, uh, and, and, and we experienced this same issue last year. We continue to see it this year, and that is uh, vacancy rates. As the economy has improved, uh, and and uh, the nation as a whole, I guess, uh, is is has reached full employment. Uh, we find it harder and harder to fill vacancies. Just a few years ago, we didn't have that issue. Uh, as of the end of the first quarter, we had 13 certified vacancies, uh, and that would be teaching professionals, uh, principals, and and those licensed individuals, and uh, three classified uh, vacancies. As of today, we had nine certified vacancies and five classified. Uh, so we saw a, a tick up in those classified vacancies, and that, that consists of, of uh, uh, non-teaching uh, individuals, uh, pretty much. Uh, we're facing one very big obstacle uh, in Burke County Public Schools in competing with other state agencies in the county. And that is in this year's budget, uh, the state increased for uh, all agencies other than public schools a minimum wage. Um, so we are competing for those blue collar workers, uh, particularly uh, those tradesmen uh, in maintenance, uh, plumbers, electricians, and what have you. Uh, we are not funded at by the state at the same level as the other state agencies. So we can't pay those individuals. We're starting to see an impact of that. Uh, so we're certainly hoping uh, to be able to address that issue here in the coming uh, uh, budget for 1920. Uh, the next two uh, 
columns under September year to date. We have our first quarter results uh, entitled current of $24.8 million and where we were through the first quarter of last year, which was $24.2 million. So year to year, first quarter results, we see a 2.7% increase. Uh, what we would expect to see right there, uh, if we were at full employment, uh, basically would be a 4% increase. So at this point in time, we are ahead of budget. Uh, we allocated uh, $488,000 uh, in fund balance to balance that budget uh, this year. If we continue at this pace, we certainly don't anticipate uh, using that. Um, to, to put it in perspective, last year we had allocated $385,000 of fund balance. Uh, our vacancy uh, rate throughout the year remained fairly high, not as high as it is averaging this year, and we used $98,000 in fund balance. So uh, the results in a nutshell, uh, for Burke County Public Schools is through the first quarter. We're ahead of budget. Uh, if the employment situation continues to uh, uh, remain as is, uh, we anticipate ending the year uh, ahead of budget and hopefully uh, uh, using minimal, if any, fund balance. Okay, thank you, Keith. Any questions for Keith on uh, these numbers or on any of the subsequent uh, information? Fourteen hundred and thirty-five. Is that correct? Excuse me. How many employees does Burke County School have? Oh mercy! Uh, I'm afraid to answer that. I'm not. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, we have around two thousand uh, total employees, uh, full-time equivalents, full-time uh, equivalent employees. I think somewhere in the neighborhood of around fifteen hundred. And, you, and but, you're still, as your report said, and as you also verbally said, you're down a few teachers for the year. Um, you, do you, uh, you said 13, I believe you just said 11 uh, classified vacancies. Are you, are you looking forward to fulfilling those? You're going to try to go through the year where you are? <laughs> well, we do have uh, those positions advertised as vacant. Uh, uh, it, it's just again particularly in the classified category uh, with the blue collar workers uh, we're competing with these other state agencies in Burke County which can pay a much higher wage uh, than we can in Burke County Public Schools so it's making it very difficult to, to so that part of your report is usually standard for this time of year you'll have vacancies this time of the year uh, well not as many as we're experiencing right now uh, this is the first year uh, that the state increased that minimum wage for those classified workers for the state agencies other than the public schools. I guess your policy calls for if you don't have them filled by Christmas, Jeff fills one, Johnny fills one, <laughs> Wayne fills one, Scott and me <laughs> and I. <laughs> we'll, we'll certainly take the help. It, it does make it much easier for me from a financial perspective to manage. makes it far easier to manage a budget and balance a budget. Uh, but from the operational side of things, those schools that need those teachers and Bob and Doug back here that need those maintenance workers and those tradesmen, it makes it difficult to manage for them. Yeah. That's all I had. I just wanted to understand, make sure we were pretty much on target with, with the report. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. Chairman, just one question, just out of curiosity. What's the difference in the pay? Um, from the other state agencies to what you're talking about versus the school system? Well, the, the other state agencies uh, for a, a classified, uh, non-certified, non-teaching positions, 31.5, I believe is what that was, that minimum wage equated to for other state agencies, we're at about 27 starting. So we're at a huge disadvantage per position. If you get down into some of the other trades, such as uh, uh, custodial workers, uh, the the disparity is even greater. You know, we're looking at about twenty four thousand uh, versus the the thirty one thousand plus at the other agencies. So obviously, you know, those folks when they have that opportunity are 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 going to leave us to uh, uh, to make more money. Sure. Thank you. 
Other questions? All right, thank you, Keith. Thank you. This brings us to item number two, Western Piedmont Community College, presentation of financial data for a period ending September 30, 2000. Uh, I think that should probably say 18. Uh, have to be presented by Sandy Holman this afternoon. Afternoon, Sandy. Nope. Other one? There we go. I'm on now. I'm going to give a brief recap of fiscal year 2018. Uh, I didn't have a slide for it, but we're just going to go over that quickly. Uh, in our state funds, we spent $14,448,758 out of a total budget of $14,534,332, which is a little bit over 99% of our state budget. Those remaining funds were mainly categorical funds that had to be spent for a specific reason. Uh, so we did spend pretty much all of our state budget. With our county funding, we spent nine, a little bit over 95% of our county funding with a carry amount of 131,775, which is pretty much committed to fa facility repairs the biggest one being repairs and resealing of the Pfeiffer Hall roof. That's the only building that we have that has that metal roof and we've had a lot of leaks and issues with that roof and so we will we'll be resurfacing that and resealing it. And that's what that was committed for. So we spent uh, 2,353,424 out of the total county budget of 2,485,200 for fiscal year 2018. I'll move on into a brief summary of our finances through September 30th, 2018, the first quarter of fiscal year 2019. Again, the first columns that you'll see there are our state funds, and we have a current uh, formula budget of $14,003,491. We've received additional allocations since the beginning of July of $401,938 for a total state budget of $14,405,429. Through September 30th, we've spent $3,404,044, which is 23.6% of our budget. This is Again, cash basis, so it is actual numbers, not anything that's encumbered. Usually the first quarter of the year is our lightest year because that's just when we're getting back in, starting up, buying stuff for the fall semester. So it normally is our lightest month. The 23.6 is a slightly higher than what we normally have for the first quarter, uh, but we started to try to get a lot of the equipment purchases in earlier this year. So I still feel that we're in, in good shape with our state funds. The only concern that we really have there is whether there will be any reversions of state funds uh, throughout this year to help with Hurricane Florence as they continue rebuilding down there. The next three columns that you see is our uh, county budget uh, with actual expenditures through September the 30th. Our current budget is $2,553,000 and we have received four uh, we have received 421,736 of our budget and spent 573,106, which is 22.4% for the first quarter. Uh, this is actually a little bit less than the previous year. Uh, we've had some savings and salaries where we've lost another employee uh, to another county funded agency. Again, as Keith was mentioning, uh, the school system and the community colleges aren't uh, held by, to that 31,400 as a minimum. So that's also been an issue that we've been facing uh, the past few months as well. So it, we're really good for the first quarter. Uh, you'll see a negative there, but that's only because we didn't receive the September uh, county appropriation until October the 1st. So everything is fine there. We did get that money in. The next uh, three columns is our institutional funds. As we talked about, this is pretty much everything else other than state and county. It's where we keep our student financial aid, our categorical funds, uh, grants, and bookstore. And so our budget for fiscal year 2019 is 5,789,520, which through the first quarter we spent 2,396,745. Again, institutional funds use a lot more during the first quarter because a lot of that is our federal and state financial aid, which is the first payment is paid in September for the fall semester. And so that's why that's a much higher percentage there. Overall, we feel really good about where we are right now for fiscal year 2019. Again, the only real 
concern that we have is the possibility of state reversions uh, throughout this year that we may have. The second slide that you have shows our county expenditures by uh, categories so that you can see where we are with our highest uh, categories, which salaries and benefits is at 26%, insurance at 21.2, and utilities at 29.4. Salaries and utilities will always be those higher categories that we have with our county funding. Uh, the insurance is higher in the first quarter because we do go ahead and pay our insurance annually versus breaking that down into payments. So most of our insurance policies come due in that first quarter and we get that out of the way. As we go through the year, that percentage will actually go down compared to other items, but salaries and the utilities are always gonna be your higher categories for our county funding. So I know that was brief, but I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have about where we are through the first quarter of fiscal year 2019. Okay, thank you, Sandy. Gentlemen, you've heard the information. Any questions for Sandy? Mr. Chairman, not necessarily a question, but I did want, uh, I remember last year when we did this, and uh, I believe your insurance showed 76% or something like that, and you told me that most of your insurance is paid up front, and that's the reason that we must have altered that a little bit because you're, you're down to 21% here. It may have been in that first quarter. It, um, can't think of it being that high, but it, it may have been a higher amount. But it, in the first quarter, it's usually pretty high because we do pay all of that in that first quarter. Yeah. All okay. but maybe one or two policies, but everything, the bigger policies come due in the first quarter. Okay. But you're pretty, more, more, pretty much where you need to be for this time of year with your expenses. With county funding, I think we're, we are in very good shape. Again, unfortunately, we have some savings due to some salaries but we feel like we're in pretty good shape. Uh, the repairs and facilities that we need this year are seem to be in line. We don't, I don't see any surprises. Doesn't mean that something can't happen, uh, especially with all the rain that we've had this summer. Uh, and even now going into the winter, it looks like it's gonna be a rainy season. Uh, we've your, had a couple roofs with some leaks, but we still feel like we're in really good shape. Is your student count up a little bit? You said it was down a little bit the last time. You know, over the last several years, about seven years, we've been experiencing a decline for the fall semester. We have plateaued, so we feel really good about where we are there and hope to actually even turn that around. We had higher numbers with our high school students, our CCP program, and so we feel like we uh, have finally turned that corner there along with the rest of the, the state as far as our FTE. My granddaughter's coming to your yeah. high school. We're happy to have her. Other questions for Sandy? All right, hearing none. Thank you, Sandy. Appreciate you being here. Item number three on the presentation agenda is the update from Partners Behavioral Health Management as of June 30, 2018. That will be presented by Tara Conrad this afternoon. Hi. Tara. Hi. Thank you for allowing me to come and present our um, figures for 12 months ending June 30th of 18. This is quite loud. Um, so on your first slide, I wanted to do a comparison between fiscal years 16, 17, and 18 to give you an idea of the number of individuals we've been serving here in Burke County, as well as the expenditures. So if you can see by the grid in the first column with um, Medicaid in fiscal year 16, we served 3,282 individuals. The number of individuals that were eligible for Medicaid in Burke at that time was 20,776. So we were hitting a little over 15% penetration rate. And our total expenditure in Medicaid dollars for that particular year was 26.6 million. In regards to state dollars, same year we served 1,307 and expended 3.6 million. If you look at fiscal year 17, we served 3,225 Medicaid, 1,186 in state dollars. Your number of eligibles in Burke was 19,502. Our penetration rate was 16.5%, and our expenditures in Medicaid was 28.1 million, and in state dollars, it was 3.3. Now, in regards to the penetration rate, that may seem low, but not everyone that receives Medicaid 
needs behavioral health services. So we're out there doing a lot of education and engaging with those that need treatment. So if you look at physical year um, 18, we served 3,301 Medicaid recipients, 1,461 in state dollars. Your penetrate, I mean, your Medicaid eligibles was 19,267. We're hitting a 17.1% penetration rate and we expended 30.1 million in Medicaid dollars and 3.7 in state dollars. Any questions with that slide? Okay, the next refers to cost of persons served by disability. And again, this is 12 months ending June 30th. The um, uh, under intellectual developmental disabilities, you can see this particular category is our highest cost. We spent 17.7 million in Medicaid dollars, 790,300 in state dollars. Next is the mental health category, disability, we spent 10.2 million and with state dollars, 1.8 million. And in substance use, again, this is a very unique population. A lot of those may not qualify for Medicaid and our state dollar um, pot of funding is limited more than Medicaid is non-limited. So substance use, we spent 1.2 million and in state dollars, 1.1 million on treating substance use disorders in 1718. Any questions with that slide? Okay. The next one are the number of individuals served by disability. Um, under intellectual developmental disability, with children, we served 78, adults, 274. Now again, this population is our population that requires more expenditure than the other disabilities, and that is because individuals with developmental disabilities, those are lifelong needs of the consumer. So you expect that cost to be a little more, um, and they require different types of services. If you look under mental health, we serve 1,333 children with a mental health disorder, and 2,429 adults with a mental health disorder. And under substance use, we serve 70 children with that disorder and 1,066 adults with that disorder. Now again, a, a caveat with substance use is sometimes individuals come in and they're duly diagnosed. And a clinician may pick up on mental health disorder prior to realizing they have a substance use disorder. A lot of substance use um, disorders depend on records as well as the individual disclosing information. So they may come in presenting with a different issue and the underlying concern is the substance use and that may not be picked up as primary or principal, principal rather. Any questions with that? One quick, quick uh, question. Is any of this under duplication, Tara? Like, if you're serving anybody under disability, you would also serve them under, um, what was your other category? We just Principal, uh, principal or primary? Uh, disability, yeah. And oh, intellectual and or mental health or substitutes? Yeah, would any of that duplicate itself? Um, not so much in the intellectual developmental disability. Your duly diagnosed often comes if it's mental health and substance use. So an individual may have a primary condition of mental health, although substance use is being treated as well. Is that what you're asking? So they could be, it is possible that you may have a few that's counted. Twice in, in different years. categories, yes. Yes. That answers the question. Thank okay. you. And outcomes related to your county expenditures for the 12 months ending 6-30-18. Uh, mental health substitute use services, the SOAR position, that was a position that was located at Burke Integrated Health. That particular position was responsible for engaging with consumers and trying to get them on benefits. Again, our um, 
limited pot of money is state dollars. So if an individual qualifies for Medicaid and we can get them enrolled in Medicaid, that particular pot of money is whatever service is needed is an entitlement for the individual. So we serve them under that and reserve our limited pot for those individuals with no funding streams. So the SOAR worker at the Integrated Health served um, 44 applicants and they had um, within integrated care within that facility we also use county dollars to expand the hours of services at that site and with the expansion of hours we were able to see 494 more had 494 more visits than would have typically happened without the use of county dollars and in 44 applicants were served um, and connected to benefits through the SOAR worker. Services in the jail, again, we have a licensed clinician and a peer support specialist in the jail. Uh, CBBH provides that service for us and 158 individuals received behavioral health treatment while they were in the jail. Most uh, substance use treatment, but some received mental health services while present in the jail. Psychiatric support is also provided by CBBH for us, and they were able to um, have 1,601 patient visits with the use of county dollars. Embedded therapist at DSS, this was a new um, initiative we did this year, or this previous fiscal year with DSS. Our provider is a caring alternative. We, they have a therapist located at the DSS building and they're able to do immediate assessments on children or adults as they come in. They can de-escalate crisis situations, do assessments on site and assist with any family or individual counseling that's needed. So that therapist was able to see 24 individuals while embedded there at DSS and that service continues. A psychiatric services, Blue, um, Blue Ridge Healthcare is our provider for that. They, of course, have a psychiatric unit. They receive Medicaid dollars from us to serve those individuals. The individuals with no funding stream, we um, supplement their contract with state dollars. When they've exhausted that, and they always do, just because the need's so great, then we supplement with county dollars. And with the use of county dollars, they were able to treat 26 individuals from Burke County in their psychiatric services unit. And the next particular slide, housing, that um, we have various providers providing support for housing, and that again is assisting someone to get into stable housing, someone with uh, mental health or substance use disability. In those situations, it's usually duly diagnosed. Um, so 16 individuals were served through the housing department. Um, specific evaluations or treatment, we had different um, psychologists providing those assessments for us and we served two unique consumers and those individuals were outside of a funding stream at the time the assessment was needed. So we utilized county dollars for that. Your system of care community collaboratives, Burke County has two, one for adult, one for child and um, the collaboratives were able to provide 12 distinct trainings here in the community, um, education, and 30 comfort kits. I don't know if you guys are familiar with comfort kits, but there are kits provided to children entering DSS custody. And often when kids are removed from their home, they uh, may leave behind some personal hygiene items or effects of that nature. Comfort kits supply all of that to them, as well as some um, encouragement, self-help, empowerment books are included within the comfort kits. And psychiatric support and medication, we contract with Good Samaritan Clinic to cover some individuals that um, show up there as opposed to a psychiatrist in the community. And they were able to serve 570 patients and wrote 1,522 scripts to serve those individuals. So any questions with that slide? Or any slide? <laughs> any questions? Going back to the, the Medicaid, 
going back to the Medicaid versus state funding. Yes. Uh, are there specific qualifications that would uh, apply the state funding, or is that strictly indigent funding? What? How does that work? It is indigent as long as the individual meets medical necessity, and we use the same criteria for both Medicaid and state dollars, and those requirements are established through federal regulations as well as state. So if you have a need for a particular treatment service and you were indigent, but you met the medical necessity criteria for that service, we would fund that service for you. Now again, Medicaid is an entitlement, so we're required to cover whatever is needed, period, for that individual, as long as the, the medical necessity is met. State dollar, however, is a limited pot of money for us. And that is typically the pot of money that gets, gets reduced by legislation each year and has for the past several years. So that pot of money, we're limited. And once we allocate all of that out to a provider and they expend those dollars, then we can't serve anyone under state dollars. We've been fortunate in that we've been able to cover treatment services and we haven't um, expended all of our funding, but that's how it works. So Medicaid's an entitlement where state dollars are not, but you have to meet medical criteria to receive either one. All right. Thank you. Other questions, comments for Tara? All right, thank you, Tara. Hey, thank you. Which brings us to item number four on our agenda scheduled public hearings. First one comes from BDI, conveyance of property for speculative building at Burke Business Park and the public hearing. This will be presented by Alan Wood this afternoon. Afternoon, Alan. I sent you a uh, <clears throat> proposal. Uh, we have an, a contractor developer who is uh, interested in building a spec building on lot G of the business park. Uh, as you go into the park, it uh, is the uh, <clears throat> first entrance or first lot on the right as you enter from the cul-de-sac. You could enter it from two different locations. The uh, proposal is for a 50,000 square foot uh, building. Uh, it would be finished on three sides. It would leave one side open for expansion. Uh, we would uh, look at it and set it where it would be the maximum amount of space possible to be utilized on that lot for expansion. Uh, the agreement says that it would be at least 28 foot clear uh, under the eaves. Uh, we might prefer 30, but a minimum of 28 foot. 28 feet clears uh, probably gets 85 to 90 percent of all the projects. Once you start going over that, <clears throat> your price starts going up substantially, and it's probably not worth it to go after those. And if you have more, need more clear than that, they're normally bigger buildings. So, fifty thousand expandable to my best estimate is you could put a hundred to one hundred twenty-five thousand square feet on that lot, and still allow for parking and truck or uh, and dock space. Um, the discussion that we've had is that we would provide the lot to them at uh, no charge. Uh, they would build the building and would not expect any participation on our end for carrying costs or, or other costs associated with that. Uh, there would, however, not be any property tax due on it until the end user was in place. Uh, they have 12 months to begin construction from the time we convey the property. Uh, if not, it reverts back to BDI. Um, <clears throat> I think that covers most of the particulars on it. We've, I've had other uh, discussions on this. This is the furthest along I've gotten. Uh, this one is about as clean and as good on our end. We know what our costs pretty much are up front, the conveying of the property. Uh, getting the uh, utilities to the lot lines, but we don't have any other upfront cost or back end cost. Uh, so uh, the, it, I think this is a, a good proposal and it's a strong chance for us to uh, get the first property 
going in that business park. All right. Thank you, Alan. Gentlemen, you've uh, had this information. I heard Alan's explanation. Any questions for Alan at this point? Mr. Chairman, just a, a place of clarity. Uh, it's not in your presentation here, but in the newspaper article that talked about septic tanks or septic systems. Sewer, yes. Sewer, yeah. And I had the, I have used a couple of times in my campaign presentations that we were looking at water and gas, but most of the time I thought a sewer would be up to the individual. So now we do have, is it Morganton or who that's going to run sewer? Well, sewer is to the back lot line of the part of the property. Yes. It would need to be extended out to the lot lines. Generally, when you have something of this nature, it is the provider or it's the entity that owns the property that brings it to their lot lines and then they're responsible to bring it from the lot line into the building. Uh, I have and I'm continuing to have conversations uh, to find partners, uh, grant money that would assist us with uh, the extension of the utilities to this and I think that uh, <clears throat> we have a really good chance of doing that without uh, any additional funding uh, coming due from well, that's, uh, any that's of the some of the best news I've heard because what's held us up a lot has been the water and the gas and the sewer and here we have you know we have the opportunity we we know what we can do with the water now we have a plan for that and so uh, that's a big plus for that property I appreciate that information that's all I had, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Other questions? Alan, you said the building would be finished on three sides. Did, just can you clarify that? Does that mean? Uh, Usually open one, leave one side open for expansion. It so it'll be completely open? Yeah. I, I mean, there's not anything really in there they would have. Uh, uh, it's one of the things, one of the questions they, and, and this one is about 50-50. Sometimes they pour the floor, sometimes they don't. Uh, and, you know, they're, if the only electrical there would be rough end as you build it. So there's not really anything that um, you just have the rough end walls. So there's not really anything there to protect at that point in time. Other questions, comments? All right, thank you all. This time we'll remain on the agenda without objection. Thank you. Our number two, Community Development and Zoning Text Amendment, ZTA 2018-02, and public hearing. This will be presented by Peter, Pete Minter, our senior planner. Afternoon, Pete. Afternoon, Mr. Chairman, low board, and distinguished members. Um, please ex excuse my scruffiness today. I'm supporting uh, prostate cancer awareness and uh, one of the uh, friends in our um, upstairs department tax uh, husband has prostate cancer and I'm, I'm uh, trying to support that cause um, by not shaving for the month of November so uh, uh, please well my wife's not too uh, happy about it so uh, those Thanksgiving pictures might, she may not be smiling too, too big, but Christmas, I think, will be different. Um, today, I'd like to uh, present a zoning text amendment um, for the record, um, zoning text amendment 2018-02. And um, this came about uh, when we received a site development plan for what used to be the former Mountain Harbor Marina. It's now uh, Lake James Marina, uh, has new ownership, and they are proposing a, an expansion of that marina. And um, it's actually gonna be um, substantial if, if everything is approved uh, as planned. Um, they got 68 current boat slips in there um, they're proposing another 152 boat slips and 20 jet ski um, slips as well so as we began to um, 
review the uh, site development plan uh, with the zoning ordinance, we noticed that um, we didn't have a whole lot of um, standards to go by. And so um, that got us to um, think of um, coming up with, with some. And so in order to do that and to be fair and flexible, we, we met with um, the, the owner of the marina. We met with Duke Energy, who also does permitting of, of docks on, on Lake James to get some input. And we reached out to uh, a local dock builder as well. Uh, to try to uh, come up with some design standards that would be um, fair and equitable to, to all. Um, and so in, in doing that, we've come up with the proposed zoning text amendment. And uh, in that amendment, there's actually three requests. Um, and one was added by the planning board after they met to discuss this uh, amendment and um, they voted um, five to zero uh, by the way to recommend approval of the three amendments so um, I'll, I'll be as brief as possible here and then if if y'all need further explanation i can um, certainly go into that the first request was to amend section 402 that's our definition section of zoning ordinance um, we found that the <clears throat> definition section of marina and the def there was also a definition in section 12 uh, 1210 which um, lays out the, the standards for marinas those two definitions were not the same they they somewhat contradicted each other and so we felt that the definition within section 1202 was a better definition so with that we're proposing to strike the current definition that's in section 402 and move the definition from section 1210 to replace that definition and that you'll see as request number one um, request number two um, involved the um, standards for marinas uh, and so with that um, we um, wanted to also include the Catawba River between Lake James and the mouth of Lake Road Hiss not that there may ever be a um, a marina uh, placed uh, along that stretch of the Catawba River but um, that could be a possibility and we didn't want to be left without uh, something to regulate that so we just included that in that first paragraph of section 1210 and as you see we're striking out the um, current definition there have moved it to section 402 as the uh, proposed marina definition. And then uh, further down uh, under item two, we're adding the Catawba River uh, into that um, along with Lake James, Lake Hickory, and Lake Road Hiss. Uh, items three and four are new uh, and uh, proposed to be added into that section as well. Those um, pertain to certain standards um, that we feel are important. Uh, one, that they comply with North Carolina State Building Code and also the um, um, ICC-A 117.1-2017 as amended. That's actually the accessibility code uh, so that <clears throat> standards will be uh, incorporated into um, these um, marina dock designs that take into account uh, accessibility and then we came up with some specific design and construction standards um, which 
are listed in a table form and uh, I won't read through each and every one of those but would be glad to go back if you had any questions and, and answer those. And then finally, um, the planning board recommended um, adding a use to the use table for marina, which we currently do not have, and also to um, identify the um, zoning districts in which the, the marina use would be allowed and also to um, uh, stipulate which, how those um, marina uses would be allowed, either by conditional use, which is uh, identified by a C, or uh, a use by right, which is identified by BX. If it doesn't have anything there, it would not be allowed in that zoning district. So um, we have the R3, PRMU, uh, CDL, CDE, RMU, GB, GBCD, uh, PRMU, CD, and CDL, CD, CDE, CD. And <clears throat> you uh, notice that the um, zoning districts with the CD after it have an X, and that's because when you just um, zone in that district, the use would not be a conditional use that's incorporated into um, <clears throat> the, the zoning district so that's why those are an X in that uh, location and again the planning board met and um, heard this case and decided uh, unanimously, unanimously to uh, recommend approval five to zero for this text amendment and that's all I have at this time. I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. All right. Thank you, Pete. Gentlemen, any questions uh, on this matter? Mr. Chairman, I have uh, uh, a couple of real short questions. Uh, first of all, that's a beautiful rendition. And, Pete, my, my biggest question is if we change the definition of the marinas, and any current marina out there, will they have to be updated to this? Will it put them out of business? Or is this just going forward with new marinas? Good question. Um, this would be moving forward. It would not um, um, go retroactive and make anybody go out of business or have to upgrade to this standard. If they did any <clears throat> new development or renovation, of the marinas, they would have to meet that standard. And my second question is, is a little bit of selfish, just so for my own benefit. That's so pretty. How much money investment would it take to get a marina built like that? Is it prohibitive? In other words, can you build it reasonable enough to make any, you know, to make any money with it? Well, uh, apparently these folks think so. Um, from what they didn't throw out a whole lot of dollar figures, but they they uh, did sort of let on, uh, I don't know if it's true or not, that it would be about $70,000 per, um, um, I don't know what you call that, um, um, each space. space, you know, the dock itself, and there'll be, um, like I said, uh, several different dock structures and uh, um, I'm not sure it's a how beautiful many. rendition uh, yeah, I understand the structure I, yeah and I, I just wonder if it, it to, to build it it's if it's going to be so cost prohibitive you can't you can't make enough money to stay in business that that won't help any of us but right it's, <laughs> yeah it's these beautiful. that that's why we thought it would be important to meet with with that dock um, owner um, to get his feedback and thoughts um, as we created an ordinance so it wouldn't be too um, cumbersome for them, you know, financially to do. And they um, they didn't have a lot of issue with, with what we, we did some, you know, some give and take there, but um, uh, I, I think this would be a good ordinance moving forward. Thank you. Other questions? Mr. Chairman, 
Pete, uh, under your staff recommendation, you have that no flat surface or second level to the roofing framing as an additional requirement. Is that going to be a standalone requirement, or do you want to move that requirement back up into the text amendment itself? Um, I think that um, if the board <clears throat> was was in favor of that um, addition, that we would probably put that into the um, uh, <clears throat> Probably the roof framing okay. section of of the table. Sounds good. Yeah. Other questions? Do you need anything from us at this point to to do what Commissioner Carswell just suggested? Or um, no, I, I I think I can. Um, Go ahead and move that into the roof framing, and then um, that will be what what you look at on on the uh, public hearing. Okay. Any other questions, gentlemen? I think Pete and I have already taken care of that. I'm checking. Okay. Yeah. Remember us talking about it. But. All right, hearing no other concern, this item will remain on the uh, scheduled public hearing agenda uh, without objection. Thank you, Pete. Yes, sir. Let's bring this to item five, consent agenda. First item being uh, Burke County Public Schools, school construction change orders number 12 and 13. This will be presented by Doug Setzer. Good afternoon, Doug. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Thank you for time this afternoon. We'll talk about change orders 12 and 13 this afternoon. Uh, change order. Order number 12, you see there are uh, some addition of canopies to our building, the new Mountain View Elementary School. Uh, options one and three there will cover the entire front of our school, uh, all the way down to the public use auditorium, uh, all the way back up to the end of the building on Bouchelle Street. And uh, option two is in the rear of the building. It covers a public entrance in the back, ties on to our existing canopies that we have for our students who go out to the bus parking lot each day with the use of the the public use that we en envision on this school i think this canopy as well it helps the functionality of the school uh, gets the kids out of the weather when they're out there waiting on rides in the afternoon and also help the public as they come to our gymnasium and auditorium on the weekends the total of those three are uh, $358,757, and they will match the canopies that we have existing that we put up there already. The second section there is talking about uh, its addition of 10 card readers on the exterior doors. That way it would enable us to know who's coming into the building and allow us to, to limit that of who we have in. And of course, then we would know who had entered the building at that time uh, with those card readers, and that's a safety thing that we've uh, we've added some card readers to other schools that we've got for safety, just to be sure who comes in and out of our schools, trying to secure our entrances. And then the third part, you see, that was forty-one thousand eight hundred eighty-seven dollars. The third one that you see there for seventeen thousand eight hundred thirty-nine. Uh, when we got in the school and, and got kids in there, we decided we needed to move the daycare exchange rooms with an art room there that gets our daycare students down next to the gymnasium and the cafeteria that they use this af each afternoon and also gets them down we're doing that feeding program in the afternoon from three o'clock to six and it just keeps uh, that end of the school sort of occupied by those daycare kids and the public at that time so the total of that change order number 12 is four hundred eighteen thousand four hundred eighty three dollars any questions on change order 12? Questions on this side? Okay, carry on, Doug. Change order 13. There's several items in this, uh, things that we've uh, gone through as we got into the building. The first one you see there, the glazing of 10 doors or five sets for 13,929. That enables our, the glass in those doors to go to a 90-minute fire rating, and also it's laminated glass to prevent uh, any kind of entrance into those rooms or that section of classrooms. So that, that's a safety safety issue there. 
Uh, speaker colors, uh, that's in the gymnasium. Uh, they had spec black and the top of the gymnasium, that area is white or beige. Uh, they did give us a credit for the black ones and we wanted the white speakers there in the gymnasium to be less noticeable when people's in there. So that's $1,349. Uh, the electrical handhold, the concession building that was added, uh, that was two inch conduit that went to a handhold and got power almost to our digital sign that we put putting up down the, uh, uh, looking at the corner of Bushell and Sanford. We've laid the block on it, uh, got the footings poured and hopefully start erecting our digital sign uh, this Friday. And we did get a credit for the sign that planned just put a regular sign out there, but we got a credit for that and went with the digital sign. Uh, the additional paving on Alphabet Lane, that's the biggest part of this change order. Uh, we had uh, cut that straight up pretty good, putting in additional sewer, replacing some sewer lines, water lines, uh, utilities coming up through there. And it was uh, almost, uh, it's pretty rough, impossible to travel. So uh, that's repaving over those areas where we've cut through and uh, restriping that. There's an additional charge down here. Addition of the uh, logo and the gymnasium in the middle court, that's $3,421 the Bobcat logo. Uh, we added gate openers to our entrance gates out there on Bouchelle Street. One entrance coming in, uh, three lanes of traffic, and then an uh, automatic gate on the exit end of that also for $491. And there's the additional striping uh, to the paving of Alphabet Lane I talked about for $9,688. Uh, there's the credit that we received for the road signage that uh, was not digital. We got the uh, $4,667 credit. The flooring alteration, the uh, Broadloom carpet that was in the auditorium, it's an additional $6,000. Uh, what uh, carpet was specced in there was on the uh, price of the lower tier price. Uh, the committee that got together decorating the school, uh, the sample we saw that they preferred was at uh, a higher price tier on that, so it was an additional $6,100 there. It had a 20-year warranty on it, uh, more durable and uh, more easy to maintain. And the IT equipment there for uh, $1,026, that was some sleeves that we had needed, our IT department needed to get to other areas of the school where they needed uh, their data lines brought to. And stainless steel counters in the concession stand for $2,517. And that was just, uh, we were afraid that with wood on that and the weather raining in on it, just be uh, rotting out this stainless steel. We should be good for, uh, for a lifetime of the school. So that particular uh, change order was a total of $114,255. Any questions? All right, thank you, Doug. Any questions on this item? I've got a couple of I think we're ready for you. <laughs> well, one question, a couple of questions I had really. Uh, we opened the school, and I'm assuming that all this changes you are making, for example, on the windows and the patio doors and all that, they were already there. We couldn't have let kids in. Is that correct? Uh, some of the changes were the canopies, which are the biggest part. They're coming. It'll probably be spring before they are, uh, before they are installed. Uh, some of the larger, most of them were. Basically, the school was complete. Uh, the uh, building inspector with the city of Morganton gave us our certi certificate of occupancy. We are still working on a punch list to finish up, but we hope to, uh, on our mechanical systems, do our finish our test and balancing over Thanksgiving. And then uh, we will have our uh, mechanical system a commissioned uh, group come in and do that to be sure everything's running like it should be, and we hope to finish that up uh, at Christmas break. Well, you had you had done doors, windows, and patios, um, and you also covered. I understand the uh, replacing of the asphalt that got tore up. And I guess the question is just, uh, you know, those. Uh, Glasses is a safety insulation that adds safety. I guess a bullet can go through it, or 
it would be very difficult for it to. Yeah. It's a laminated glass like we've got in our reception area. If someone came in there, uh, they couldn't get through it yeah. easily. What it's happens laminated. to the stuff now there? What about the windows? Already? These are installed already. Yes, most of that uh, you see on change order 13 is already done or was in the school when we took occupancy of this. So that change was made and just now catching up with the paper. Yes, sir. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. By the way, what's the total up to now on the total project? We are still within budget. I think we're at about 24 million with the furniture, uh, computers, all our technology that we've put in there, but we are still within budget. Correct. 24 million. Should this be the last of the change orders, Doug? No, sir. They may be uh, one, <laughs> one or two more. I thought the budget was 22. <laughs> uh, the building was actually 20, and then with the furniture and uh, technology, the other uh, things that go in with that, that's what's taking it to 24. Other questions, comments? All right, here now. Thank item, you. Thank you, Doug. This item will remain on the, on the consent agenda. Item number two, clerk, appointments and removal to Park and Recreation Commission. This will be presented by Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, Joey Lindsay was on the Parks and Recreation Commission representing uh, the Valdez Rutherford College. Uh, he resigned, and we received an application from Doug Knight, who is the uh, Recreation Director for Valdez. And um, we received an application for seat number seven, which was vacant, from Jason Black. So this is a request to remove Joey Lindsay and thank him for his service and to appoint Doug Knight to seat number four for the remainder of an unexpired term ending March 31st, 2020, and to appoint Jason Black to seat number seven representing W.A. Young, also for the remainder of an unexpired term ending March 31st, 2021. All right, thank you, Madam Clerk. Any questions on this item? Hearing none, this item will remain on the consent agenda without objection. Item number three, community development, except the enclave trail easement. This will be presented by Shane Prisby, our community development operations manager. Afternoon, Shane. Afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Um, unlike my colleague, Pete Minter, I do not have a noble justification for my scruffiness. Um, hopefully you will <laughs> excuse that as I move forward. Um, so... The Community Development Department has been working with the developers of the Enclave at Lake James subdivision, um, that is BFH Partners LLC, um, as we went through the process to approve um, their major subdivision. Um, and one of the components to that is a trail easement for the Fauna Flora State Trail and Over Mountain Victory National Historic Trails. Um, this is about a 1.5 mile easement 50 feet wide, um, it would connect into the 1780 subdivision um, about where we left off. Um, there's an existing bridge at that point, which is great. Um, huge cost savings for us on that. Um, and this would take the trails, plural, from um, 1780 where we have existing trail over through the enclave development to, um, to about the McDowell County line. Um, so that would be us from the lake to McDowell County, um, and this easement includes a parking area at that location so we can bookend our section of the trail with some parking access um, to go end to end. Um, so we're, we're pretty excited about this. Um, the agreement, um, we've uh, received a draft agreement. I've made some comments on that, suggested changes, and that's been sent to the county attorney for review. Um, any questions that you have about this? All right, thank you, Shane. Any questions for Shane on this side? Mr. Chairman, the latitude to kind of sidebar. Yeah. The enclave, as I drove up to uh, our place, the enclave just suddenly appeared, didn't know it was happening. Uh, uh, is it in Burke and McDowell County, and how big is it? Uh, yes, it is um, in both, a uh, portion of it straddles the county line. Um, the majority of it is in Burke County. 
they're going to build homes? That is correct. Um, so they, well, uh, the developer will not. The developer um, put in the roads, um, broke up the parcels, um, got to the point where then they sell them off to um, people who purchase the land and then would be developing homes, second homes, boat docks, and the like. So is our easement at the front near the highway or at the back near the lake that we want for the trail? Um, it is near the back portion. Um, right now, a portion that does include some roadwalk options um, as well as uh, at the lower part where it comes in from 1780 down, um, goes downhill, the, the lake comes up. Um, we cross where a stream comes through, um, but we do have an easement um, access to uh, a community area that has a shared boat dock and a fire pit and some other basic amenities. So that's part of this easement is so that users can come from the 1780 development, walk down that existing road to where the boat dock area is and, and cook, relax, get some lake views, or, and then, or choose to continue on up the trail as it gains elevation, ties in with the existing roads, um, and then comes down the other side. And we will have parking inside the enclave area itself? Uh, yes, um, it is a gated community, and our parking will be off of, um, and I can't remember the name of the road, um, but it will be on the lower side of the lot, on the McDowell side of the county. Um, so people won't go into the enclave to park. They will go around the enclave, and the parking area is right off of um, a public road. So public right road. off South Mountain Institute Road. That's what passes in front of it. Okay. That's all. Okay. Thank you. And uh, just one more note. The um, por portion of the easement um, has been left as kind of an easement area. And what that basically allows us to do is, um, because I wasn't 100% confident on um, on the, the final trail route that I'd like to, to use for it, um, and considering their timeline, what they allowed us to do is gave us an area of which we could put the trail if we can find a better option that could cut, uh, negate the need for a bridge, which is what I'm hoping for, um, and cut our cost down substantially. Um, once we figure out what that final trail route will be, our easement will shrink in that area down to 50 feet, uh, 25 feet from center. So um, it gives us some flexibility, and for the parcels that it goes through, they end up with a trail hopefully further away from their building envelope. So um, it gives us flexibility, and everybody wins on that one. Okay, other questions for Sharon? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, Shane, just one other quick question. That's a 50-foot wide right away. That's correct. And it's a mile and a half long. Correct. That's an enormous gift from an individual. And it says no direct cost. Who will prepare that enclave or the parking or wherever? Who will be responsible for that? Uh, the development will be our responsibility. Um, what they're granting us is the access um, and the right to develop a trail and those amenities within that area as defined. Well, is that right away cleared, woods, trees? Clearing would be our responsibility as well. Pardon? Clearing would be our responsibility as well. Okay. Um, what we've done is either include that as part of the contractor's responsibilities or we have worked with the North Carolina bridge crew to have that done and um, the bridge crew works at no cost to us as they use it so for they do training. the work for the cost or the value of the timber? Um, it's a low level offender program um, and they're also known as fire crew. So for them, it's, um, an, it gives them the ability to train um, incoming members to the bridge crew on basic um, crew techniques, chainsaw safety. So they come through, they do the cutting, they have their program, um, and they do it on their timeline, usually in the winter when um, their work slows down and they're not required for active burns or responding to um, wildland fire. Somebody ought to give him or and or her a hug. That's an awfully large gift. Thank you. You answered the questions. This is the same developer that gave us all the easements in Water Canyon. So this this is a fifty feet easement, though the trail is only six feet wide, I believe. I can't. That is correct. So you won't necessarily be clearing the entire fifty feet. 
speak. To... Uh, no, we'll, we'll clear just what is necessary, but what this gives us is some flexibility within that area to avoid trees or obstacles or boulders or um, there's a lot of um, uncertainty when you start getting in the ground for trails. So this gives our uh, contractors some wiggle room to make those um, moment to moment decisions in the field to end up with the best trail with the minimum impact. All right. Thank you, Shane. Any other questions? All right. Here and then this item will remain on the consent agenda without objection. Thank you. Item number four, finance, electronic payments resolution. This will be presented by Margaret Pierce, our Deputy County Manager, Finance Director. Good afternoon. Margaret. Good afternoon. The attached resolution authorizes Burke County to engage in electronic payments. This was sent out by the LGC and recommended that each county and, and city adopt it. It basically uh, authorizes something that's happened for 20 or more years, which is accepting and processing electronic payments with the state and other vendors. They just came out recently with this resolution and felt that it was important that we all adopt it to make sure we're clear, clearly legal on accepting those payments from the state. Thank you, Margaret. Any questions for Margaret on this item? All right, here and now, this item will remain on the agenda without objection. Item number five, Senior Services, the East Burke Senior Center Advisory Council bylaws. This will be presented this afternoon by our clerk, Kay uh, Drone. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, the East Burke Senior Center uh, bylaws were um, recently updated and uh, are submitted to you in accordance with our code of ordinance. Uh, there were very um, minor changes to their bylaws, uh, mostly housekeeping items, and I think they designated where they will hold their meetings, but it's very routine in nature. All right, thank you, Madam Clerk. Any questions on this matter? Here and then, this item will remain on the consent agenda without objection. Item number six and seven, tax departments, comes from uh, tax collection report and release refund report from our tax administrator, Danny Eisenhower. Good afternoon, Danny. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, tax collection report, I'll just go over the percents collected uh, late list penalty were at 32.61%, delinquent taxes were at 38.29, and current year taxes for property tax and vehicle tax is 65.3. Questions on this item? All right. Mr. Chairman, I just appreciate and thank Danny that anybody over 75 doesn't have to pay any taxes anymore. Oh. Is that right, Danny? Uh, over 65, oh, if you meet the income requirements. <laughs> okay, Danny, carry on. Okay, the release refund report for October. Uh, the report uh, has an amount of $2,729.71. We had $3,436.98 rebuilt, which give us a a negative as far as a net release. Uh, we had refunds in the amount of $170 and vehicle tax adjustments refunds were zero. All right, thank you, Danny. Any questions on this report? Okay, here and none, both these items six and seven will remain on the consent agenda without objection. Thank, thank you. you item number six, items for decision, have several decision items. The first item comes from the clerk, appointments to Board of Adjustments, so, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. We've got some uh, seats that come open or have expired on the Board of Adjustment. Um, seat number one uh, is occupied by George Mull III. Uh, seat number seven is occupied by Mario Sasechi. Uh, their terms ended September 30th, 2018. Uh, and six number seat representing the East alternate is also vacant. Um, we have two applications on file for the East seats, Rick McClure, who is a former planning board member, and Gary Kling, who is a current planning board member. Um, we uh, have planning staff, um, I've talked with them this morning and they still have not heard uh, from Mr. Mole. 
So I think that we could probably count him as uh, to remove him from the roster since he's not indicated a, a desire to be reappointed. Um, and I can update that agenda item. Um, and then we have two applications on file for the remaining two seats, uh, which would be seat number two and seat number six. And you're saying we have applications for both of those? More than one for either? Just two in total and, and you have two seats open. So I guess you could move this to the consent if you were of a mind to. Okay, gentlemen, you've heard the information. Unless we have further applicants, uh, any objection to moving this item to consent with uh, those changes? Mr. Chairman, the only reason not to do it would be if the mall comes in and requests after the deadline, do we have a deadline to enter it? No, but if you did get an application from Mr. Mull or any new applications, I would certainly let you know that and move it yes. back to decision items or let you know to move it back at the regular meeting. Fair resolution. Okay, let's, let's sound it that way then, Madam Clerk. All right, item number two, Community Development Award Grant a Contract for Pond Floor State Trail Covered Bridge. This will be presented again by Shane Christie. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, um, the Community Development Department requested funding um, in this current fiscal year for a covered trail bridge at White Creek as part of the Fauna Flora State Trail to replace the temporary crossing that um, <clears throat> is still there. Um, and we put out a request for a proposal um, and bids were due on Friday, November 2nd. Uh, we sent um, we posted the notice publicly and sent notification to nine contractors directly i was contacted by um, an additional three contractors um, from the public posting as well um, on bid opening day we received three bids that were all complete um, one from nhm constructors um, for a price on option a of uh, 202869 dollars and no cents um, global specialty contractors price for option a two hundred eighty nine thousand five hundred dollars and no cents and Vanoy construction uh, price for option a two hundred nineteen eight hundred and forty two dollars and sixty seven cents so our apparent load bidder is NHM constructors out of Asheville North Carolina um, at two hundred two thousand dollars eight hundred sixty nine this is above the budgeted amount of $150,000, um, and that leaves us with three options. Um, the first would be to reject all bids and rebid the project and hope that we got somebody um, coming in at that number. Uh, the second option would be to make up the difference um, from the general fund, and the third option would be to use the budget funds for um, the vault toilet um, to cover the difference in this project. All right, thank you, Shane. Gentlemen, you've heard the information. Any questions for Shane on this item? Mr. Chairman, I, I have a couple of questions, please, uh, and also note the size of that bridge um, right at 52 foot long and eight foot high. Now, I was doing some speed reading on this, and I may have overread it, but uh, how, how off the ground is that bridge? Um, it is above the ordinary high water mark um, for that portion of White Creek. Um, off the top of my head, um, I do not know the span from, from the water to the... Give me an S to 30, 40. It looks deep. I don't know. Uh, it would be probably about six or eight feet. How much? Six or eight feet. Six or eight. Well, I thought it was high because of uh, the need to cover it. Why are we covering a bridge on a trail walk? Uh, this particular bridge is very close to one of our main parking areas, um, which is Linville Access, and uh, it's 
the idea for this bridge is more than just a mode of transportation, but to make it um, a showpiece and an amenity for the trail as a whole. Um, and covered bridges are a big, big draw for, for many folks. Um, they're very popular in the Northeast with the historic ones, and a lot of people have um, developed either maintained existing ones or have built new ones, and they are just as popular. Um, so the thought was that this bridge being so readily accessible um, at the off of one of our main parking areas, it serves both a need for uh, trail uh, transportation to get across the creek, which we don't really have right now, and also is going to be something that people will drive to come visit um, and, and come see and, and walk across. Okay. Um, I also had the question of if you're going to put that much weight on it, put a covered bridge on it, it looks like we're using poles to drive down in the ground to construct it. Why did we not consider cement for some project that long? Um, the abutments for this bridge will be reinforced concrete. Um, so they will have rebar inside of it. Concrete will be poured around that rebar. And those will be affixed to the ground with helical piers that will also be on a batter. So that will support the weight of the bridge on both sides. That will be the point of contact with the ground. Um, and the helical piers will help anchor it in the soils, which are uh, very fine. Um, so it, it will help distribute weight and will also uh, keep it from shifting as well. Um, and then the structure itself has been designed by an engineering firm out of the North Carolina to hold the weight of not only itself, but also um, the covered portion of the bridge, the railings, um, dead weight, um, as well as snow load. So how far is the cement coming up? I do not know how deep the, uh, um, off the top of my head, how deep the uh, um, abutments are, but it would be on the plans if, if it's part of the deductible. Well, I looked at the plan and it talked about impactness and hardness of ground and how far you'd have to drive down the post to get to ground that would, you know, substantiate the weight, mm -hmm. and that's the reason I began to think about the cement. But you can, I'll ask you that later, then. If... Thank you very much, Shane. Well, this bridge will be wide enough to get four by four over there in court emergency or anything like that. Yes, it will be our widest bridge, um, so it will be, um, I believe, eight foot clear, so um, more than enough to get. Um, safety equipment through, as well as maintenance equipment. Just, just a comment, I've, I've walked that section multiple times. It's gonna be a beautiful location. You're right about the, the draw because people will come just for that feature. Um, one thing, you know, we're talking about, you said you can put it out to bed, and I think we've learned our lesson on putting things back out to bed. Things aren't getting any cheaper. And so um, you can see the, the variance from Global specialty to NHM on uh, on these numbers already, and so if you put it up to bid, it could easily go the other direction. So. I concur with that. Um, I, I think that a price of two hundred two for the full bridge, as shown um, in the plans, is is good. Um, the more I talked with folks after you know we made our, our estimations on this and talked about their considerations for it, the closer I thought we were going to be to uh, 200000 So I feel that that is um, a very good bid for this project and for what we're asking for. I don't necessarily disagree, but I, I, I would disagree with not moving forward with the vaulted toilet because I think that's a facility that's needed out there as much or more than a covered bridge. Uh, it's just my opinion. But I think the covered bridge is going to add so much to the park that uh, I'd be willing to uh, put my money where the covered bridge is. Haven't walked out there many a time like uh, Scott. Say you was making up the difference. No, <laughs> no, no, no but, uh, but, I, but I think I think it's going to be a, a wow, a 
a wild item out there. I don't disagree with you. I, I would just, I would prefer to, to allocate uh, fund balance rather than to, to trash can the toilet that I think most people are looking for when they get out there. <laughs> Any other questions? Mr. Chairman. Clerk, you act like you want to. So do we need to add something to the motion? Well, I think the motion, uh, as I heard it, uh, I was just looking. Uh, uh, I, I think you'll just have to, to add, the, you know, fund balance to make up the difference uh, if, if that's what the board chooses to do. Uh, yeah, yeah I, didn't, I didn't know if y'all want to just go forward with, with the covered bridge and when we get to the part with the vaulted um, toilets, then that's when we would, would deal with the uh, fund balance to make up. By then, you would have your your actual cost, so we know what the real figure would be. I didn't know if you had a specified budget amount for this that you. Well, it, it went into a larger total amount for projects out there. I mean, however, y'all would like to deal with it, we make that happen. Okay. Leave it as is. Yeah. Uh, I think we can do that. Like I said, when they, they bid out the vaulted toilets and the, the picnic area, I think, was included, um, we can, you know, true up things at that point in time and be done with it. All right. Any other questions, comments? All right. Thanks, Shane. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Item number three, general services awarded construction bid for active gas extraction system. This will be presented by Miles Champion, our general services director. Good afternoon, Miles. Yes. Uh, Burke County is proposing to construct an active uh, gas extraction system at the Johns River Waste Management Facility. Uh, the uh, new requirements that were issued in 2017 by DEQ requires conversion of the current passive gas ventilation system to an active, uh, active ventilation system. The project was advertised on September 28th in the News Herald and the county's website. Formal bids were uh, uh, received on uh, November 1st, uh, and uh, a, uh, uh, we had one bid who was, uh, who was qualified to bid that job. Um, the bid tabulation is uh, with the information that you have there, along with uh, just a few of the excerpts from the bid. Uh, SCS Field Services Incorporated out of uh, Reston, Virginia was the successful low bidder and only bidder at uh, um, <clears throat> base bid of uh, $223,296,000. Uh, we have an also an ad option of $7,184 for an emergency shutoff valve. Uh, staff recommends that we contract with uh, SCS Field Services Incorporated for a total of $230,480. Uh, this is within our budget. All right, thank you, Mal. Uh, any questions? Uh, looks like we just found the bridge money. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I, di I just have one. And, uh, I bring it from two concerns. When we had the North Carolina uh, uh, County Commission Association meeting in Hickory, and you go to buy all those exhibitors and they asked you questions, what are you doing, what are you doing with this? And I ran into one that was presenting to me, and I, I still probably got it in my kitty at the house, but he was talking about how much of our trash we haul and pay to haul when it can actually be burnt. And then we deal with what we bury for hundreds of years. And I think, and this is the reason I'm saying this, it doesn't have much to do with what you're presenting, except it gives me a golden opportunity to say to our board and chairman, we probably need to sit down sometime and have a work schedule on that. 
because um, I, I, uh, part of that process, he gave me some information. It takes six months for a paper cup to begin to disintegrate. Do you know how much it takes for a plastic plate or, or what's the word they use? Not pla uh, styrofoam. 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 Probably thousands of years. Thousands. Mm -hmm. And it burns. So why do you want to put that? And then on top of that, the other night, Shirley was on some TV thing, and they were showing these, where the Navy and uh, China and the United States, and they took trash out there by the shiploads and dumped it, and, and what it's doing to the ocean and killing the seas and stuff. Now, I'm not one of these uh, save the animal enthusiasts, but I am one of these that, if it makes sense, to get rid of it once and for all, and you don't worry about it, and your your great great grandkids are not going to be cleaning up cleaning up the mess that we make, and so that's one thing that I I, I just kind of wanted to plant a seed, if you will, and uh, if um, if if we could do that, maybe we it's one of those targets also that we might be neighbors with other counties. Maybe we can have one to serve three or four in the uniform, whatever. But I understand what you're doing. I don't have a question about this. I just use the golden opportunity to plant a seed. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Maynard. Other questions, comments on this item? All right. Thank you, Miles. This item will remain on the decision agenda. Thank you. Item number four, library, award of bid for uh, Valdez Public Library Expansion Renovation Project is to be presented by uh, our county manager. Thank you, gentlemen. They are actually receiving bids for that now. Um, the current space at the Burke County Library Valdez uh, location is around 62, nearly 6,200 square feet. They're talking about adding nearly 2,800 square feet. So, um, that would take us to uh, approximate square footage of 8,974 feet. And um, Jim will have those numbers. We'll be getting that out to you as soon as we verify their, their valid numbers and have this for you at your, um, your actual meeting date for a decision. All right. Thank you, Brian. Any questions from Brian on this item? All right. Without objection, this item will remain on the decision agenda. Item seven have uh, uh, reports. Uh, we have one item: finance county financial report for the period ending September 30th, 2018. This will be presented by Margaret. Gentlemen, you have uh, with you now. It came out in your packet, I believe, on yesterday. Okay. Um, everything looks good so far. We're 125 percent into the year. Um, at the end of September, everything is on target. Um, there are a couple areas slightly over, but that's due to debt service payments um, and other one-time payments during the year. Are there any items you have specific questions on or would prefer to discuss? Otherwise, we are where we need to be and in good shape. All right. Thank you, Margaret. Any questions for Margaret on these uh, budget numbers? Hearing none, this item will remain as a uh, item of report. Item eight, other discussion items, uh, courtesy reminders, uh, reports for the agenda packet are needed by uh, November 9th, that is this Friday. So if you've got things that you want Madam Clerk to uh, put in our agenda in electronic format, please provide those to her by Friday. County offices will be closed Monday, November 12th, in observance of Veterans Day. And uh, I would like to uh, thank all of our veterans for their service. And uh, I hope that some of you had opportunity to go by the Register of Deeds office last week and maybe visit with uh, those folks uh, during their uh, veterans presentation. And uh, it was a nice, nice afternoon and a nice gathering. I commend our Register of Deeds for that and thank our veterans for their service. Veterans Appreciation event will be held at Foothills Higher Education Center on Monday, 10.30 a.m. There will be a meet and greet time. At 11 a.m. will be the main event, followed by barbecue chicken lunch. So uh, 
again, an opportunity to uh, uh, honor our veterans on Veterans Day at Foothills Higher Ed. So if that's uh, something you can make, put that on your agenda. Any other items that uh, need to be mentioned at this point? Mr. Chairman, I have the clerk to lay this. At the clerk to leave you a copy of this. I attended this from Eagle Rock. <clears throat> One of the best compliments that they made out there during that whole presentation is that they have looked at several counties and have found the ideal location in the Grand Ole Bur uh, County of Burke and was very complimentary. And they are working, and I'm sure you'll hear more about that, but uh, probably urge you at some point to get on your computer and uh, they've, uh, they've got a good explanation here, but much more than on the computer of their plans. And it's, uh, while we're talking about it, it's mainly, and its main purpose and what they mainly want to do is to help and assist veterans coming back into life out of uh, many years in service. Uh, leave right. that with you. Thank you. Thank you, Manny. Appreciate that. Anything else? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Manor. All in favor say aye. I think that's all of us.